Welcome back, Josh. Uh, here we are again for another episode of the Modern Game Podcast. I think this is either episode nine or ten now. Um, how are you doing? How you, how's your week been so far on Sora? Um, yeah, I'm good. Uh, weekend was was poor. Um, one tier three won in the the form of Baffertimbi Gomis, who uh, was actually starting for Galatasaray, but now is bench fodder for Icardi. For Icardi. Now, he's, uh, now he's back playing. Um, um, fitting, he's actually, as I believe the topic we're going to talk about today is um, is, is age on Sir Rather. I'm sure you'll let everyone know. But he's actually like 36. Um, so, yeah, you know, sells, yeah. <laughs> so, sells for peanuts. Um, so, yeah, you know, and I just, um, I didn't quite make some good Sora choices at the weekend, I don't think. Um, and yeah, you know, it is what it is. Um, got Celtic back this weekend though. Um, so yeah, that's been pretty much it. I, you know, just sort of plugging away, um, trying to make some purchases to be a bit more competitive right now as I am struggling a little bit without Austria and Russia. Um, so yeah, with Croatia back, that does help a little bit. But um, mm. yeah, not so bad. My um, my bad decisions on Sora at the weekend was uh, booking in a work meeting an hour before deadline because, you know, that meant that I was not able to react to the news. Despite being tagged in the watch out Genk's going to be postponed, I uh, yeah. I only saw it uh, after the deadline. So my my teams did get did get destroyed. I had um, Hainan in my all-star rare pro which had captain sutolo who went and banged like 92 yes. uh so yeah seeing a dmp beside it, a clean sheet for nadi and a 92 for sutolo was was quite quite disappointing um i also then had a van der Voort and cuesta in my under 23s so that was another i think under 23s got like just savaged this weekend with genk not playing so i think there was a, a lot of people um that got hit by that unfortunately um, i did somehow um my run of run of good form in specialist continued and i and i managed to pull a andre kramerich as a t2 which nice. seems decent because you know he's started for Croatia. Um, I don't know if he's old enough to be considered old when we talk about the topic of the show because I think he's only thirty-two. But um, thirty-one, I think it, it, mm. yeah, exactly, exactly. But I think I thought we made it for an interesting conversation. I think you know the reason I thought about this is because I was having a discussion the other day about a couple of players, and someone had asked me why I'd bought Maxi Morales, and they're like, "Oh, is he not a bit old?" And I'm thinking, well, you know. I got the guy, got a rare for 0.12. And I think he's got an L15 of like 62. And he's yeah. arguably going to... He's moved to racing, dominant. right? Yeah, he has. So he's at New York, who, don't get me wrong, were a good club in the MLS. But in the MLS, you tend to see a lot of fixture variants, you know, like home and away. Whereas in Argentina, and, you know, I think Portugal is a great example of this as well. It's like you have truly dominant clubs who are dominant right. season in, season out. Whereas MLS, because of the way they seek to level the playing field, it's not a guarantee that, you know, a team that was great last season will be good this season. I think we saw it. If you look at the last two seasons, New England Revolution were incredible two seasons ago. Last season, they didn't even make the playoff. So I think that's a really good example of like sort of where I think about, um, you know, sort of dominance of, of teams. You know, you look at Argentina, you've got, you know, uh, racing, River, Boca, you've got some like top sides that will be there or thereabouts most seasons. Um, and Maxi Morales has moved to racing. And, you know, I actually went and watched the the Argentine Supercopa the other week. And I was watching him and he just looked like, in incredible condition. You know, you look at, you know, like someone like, um, you know, Wayne Rooney, when they came towards the end of their career, were really not in good physical condition. Morales looked in great condition. And I think another one that you sort of put in this bracket is, is Leo Refalov. You know, sometimes you look at these players and they're, and they're fitter than guys that are maybe five, six years younger than them. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, there's definitely an element of a player by player basis, but it just made me think about how the market values older players because they seem to cheaper despite having 
great scoring potential. You know, I, I know there's a couple in, in Russia as well, but I think the way that I think about this is I'm buying cards for a season, you know, and, and it's sort of like the way you look at it when you're playing under 23 is, you know, you cannot pat, like predict a player's career. You don't know, you know, how transfers or injuries are going to impact, you know, even team form is going to impact their scoring potential. So I'm always looking like when I'm building my teams, I'm saying, okay, can, can this player do a job for me? Do they, fit into the lineups you know can they deliver good so5 returns in the immediate season coming up um and i think like maxi morales ticks a lot of boxes for me like he's he's going to be the chief creator at racing he you know he takes up pieces he, he, he's decisive um potential and i was just baffled to see him going i think he's he's jumped up a little bit now um but you know, he was going for like 0.12, 0.13, around that sort of price. And I'm just thinking like for his scoring potential, there's not many that come close. And if you look at that sort of scoring potential, like, you know, players with an L15 of, of over 60, I would be expecting to see at significantly higher prices. But obviously the age is, is dragging it down. So I just, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts on like how you factor in age when making a decision on a player to purchase them or on a, on a player's value yeah sure i mean i've always been quite um i've always been quite vocal about how i feel that the so rare community as a whole is just incredibly ageist like it seems to be one of the number one um like things to put people off when when they're looking to buy a card um and that I don't know. I've always thought it's a flawed logic, and I've always sort of bought older players um, just just because I'm really not interested in how old they are. Um, if they're in contract and they're playing, then you know they can be of, of good use to me. Um, and it was something when I picked up Minor Boa. It was something I was I was thinking about. I can't remember how much I bought Minor Boa for. I wonder if I think it might have been a trade actually, um, but one of the reasons I picked him up was like he didn't have an, a contract extension. Now he now has a contract extension until the end of June 24. So again, just to quickly go off on a tangent, one thing I really like to do when I'm looking at buying older players is look at their contract situation and see if they, so for instance, someone like Luka Modric is only in contract until June 23. And then no one knows what he's going to do. Like he might retire. Um, you know, he, he might retire, he might renew, he might transfer. I think, I don't really know much about his situation. I do have one. Um, but um, it, yeah, I think sort of people are leaning towards him maybe retiring. But if he does renew or or transfer to a different club, then again, he's going to be a valuable asset for you know another season. And it's something I also sort of tend to think about is like that your turnover on cards. You know, how many cards do you pick up and hold for like two or three seasons? You know, I from when I started playing so rare, I don't. I think Remco Pasvir, funnily enough, is the only card I still have that I bought inside my first month on the platform. Um, you know, everyone else has been transferred or moved on. So, you know, in that time, does it actually matter how old they are if you're going to get out of them? Um, I suppose another thing that you need to consider is resale value. Um, you know, if does buying this player now, if I then go to sell him in twelve. 18 months time what's his resale value going to be like but i also do feel that is slightly offset by so5 potential returns like i bought naboa i think it was like 0.25 or something and he's won me like a boatload of tier ones maybe even a star rare at some point um let's just see if i can look at this and so you know he's won his worth back and really does it does it matter that i that I get him that you you know that he leaves for nothing um you know in my opinion no yeah so Naboa has won me total value now about 0.65 worth of stuff a couple of tier ones by looks of things and and a few other cards um Moritz Kjargaard looks like the best sort of card that he's won um and yeah I picked him up for in a trade with Powell funnily enough let's have a look at the value on this one (laughs) So I gave away 0.04 ETH and a Jorge Hernandez 32-year-old Supra that I won and a Mustafa Esikelak 
super rare that I won. Last public sales on those are 0.04 and 0.19. So picked up Naboa for about, yeah, like 0.25-ish in trade value with Powell. Um, and, you know, he's won me three times his value. So if he does, you know, he's got another contract extension. I fully expect him to smash for another season at Sochi. But um, if he did retire at the end of the season, you know, I'd, I don't really care. Like it's annoying to lose a to lose a good scoring SO5 asset, but he's already won me back his his worth in in SO5 yield to to sort of counter out. And that's something I always look at, you know, how long actually am I going to get out of this player? Can they keep up their sort of level of scoring, their SO5 scoring in their current situation? Um and yeah, you know, when you know what what is the likely exit on them, if any, if I need one sort of thing. So I think those are sort of my key points. And yeah, I've never never sort of strayed away from buying a player because of age. And I have definitely bought players almost because of it, because they were cheaper value than other scorers that that are similar. Um, you know, again, Christian Naboa, top forty player on the platform, top twenty midfielder. Um there's still that feature on Sarah uh, data where you can look at there is. So similar players to um, Christian Naboa, Jude Bellingham, and Joshua Kimmich are the, are the first two. There we go. <laughs> so I think they're a little yeah. bit more expensive than Naboa. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, you know Teddy Twaymer, uh, who I, I actually think he's a cracking pickup, though he's on absolute fire at the minute. His price keeps going up. Um, but yeah, Teddy Twaymer, um, Hani Mukhtar, Tony Cruz. These are all similar yeah. players according to Sarah Data. So Christian Naboa. So like top top players on the platform right? exactly yeah and you can you know there's one on the market now for 0.35 i dare say the last one for 0.24 so i dare say you can get it a bit cheap yeah i think that this is interesting when you when you talk about that so5 yields because ultimately the, the cards are assets and i i almost take like a finance approach to it like when you look at you a know, money balls type type thing well you know? Yeah, but, you know, if you look at, like, when businesses purchase assets, they consider, like, the amortization of that asset across a number of years or, like, the years of use that they get from that asset. It's essentially the hack that Chelsea are using to be able to try and get around financial fair play at the moment because what they are doing is they are spreading the cost of a player across the length of the contract. Yeah, over long term. Yeah, so then it's like, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, if they've spent 100 million on transfer fee, what they're saying is that, oh, we're not going to record that in this financial year. We're going to record one ninth of that in this financial year because we're going to have that asset for nine, nine years. And I think that what is really interesting about this is, um, you know, you, you talk about resale value. If Maxi Morales wins me a single T1 card, this season, I could probably sell him for nothing and still be up. Like yeah, that's okay. how low the risk is with this card, like buying it at like 0.12. So for me, I I consider the return on the asset, like the card that's being purchased, to be you know the SO5 yield and the resale value. You know, you've got like the you know the cost of acquisition of the card which is, you know, then you're then essentially um, deducting the returns and resale price from that to understand that what was your expense, what was your expenditure, what was your potential uh, return on, on said investment. And, you know, it, it's fascinating. Like, you know, you look at some cards that are, you know, for me, they've, they've won so many prizes that, you know, and, and Sero Data is really good for this as well because it will show you, like the percentage that that player contributed yeah. to the prize. So, you know, if they were captain and they smacked a hundred that week and, you know, your team got 400 points, then they will allocate the percentage of the value of the card at the time of winning or the ETH, if you get some ETH, they will assign that depending on the amount of points that your player scored. So it's a really good way of looking back and saying, okay, well, how much did this card yield me? And I, I think like in the, the sort of teams that I have, I'm very confident that a player like Maxi Morales could, you know, all he needs to do is grab a, you know, 80, 90 pointer one week in a strong team. And then suddenly, you know, you're in the mix for a, a T1 potentially a star. You know, one of the, the sort of other interesting metrics to look at for me is, is that payback. 
Like how long, what's the payback window? Like how long does it take to repay the investment in yeah. terms of, you know, the prizes? Honestly, you know, like I, I, I won um, oh, Cramrich. Cramrich was a, a T2 and he was worth around 0.15-ish, right? Yeah. For, for me, to, for Maxi Morales to return, like assuming I can get five T2s, right? And and he's contributed 20%. Assuming he contributed 20% of the points because he's one-fifth of the lineup. Realistically, you only need to win a handful of prizes throughout an entire season to pay back that value. And then I couldn't care less whether I sell it for nothing or not. Like I, I literally, you know, if you're up in terms of like what that card has contributed in terms of, of value, then that's a really, really good position to be in. And another great example of this, and people do it with goalkeepers as well. Yeah, like, I was, I've, I've yeah. Bought, like goalkeepers go on for years. Like I bought, <laughs> I've, I bought Frank Armani, and I couldn't believe it at the time, right? Because I got an offer of one point one ETH for Andre Blake, and I think Andre Blake's maybe early thirty. Yeah, it's like thirty-one, he, isn't he? I think. Yeah, wow. and he and he played for Philadelphia last season. Philadelphia, great, really strong in the MLS. Armani had a higher L40 than him because like River just clean sheet machines and they play midweeks with a couple of Adoras and they have a load of fixtures. He was half the price. I ended up selling Blake for 1.1 and bought Armani for 0.6. Yeah, well. Like I and I, I couldn't believe it at the time. Like when I saw the price difference, I was like, okay, this is insane. Like Blake was obviously really hyped up because Philadelphia were great last season, but I'm like, why like it just baffled me that the market like Armani is honestly one of the best goalkeepers in America he's got like two years left on his contract he plays in a dominant team that keep clean sheets regularly they have a bucket load of utility for the midweek fixtures yet he's significantly cheaper than most other goalkeepers like there's some like bang average goalkeepers in the MLS that maybe keep clean sheets in like 30% of their games selling for Armani or higher um which i just find crazy and like particularly with goalkeepers as well because goalkeepers tend to have less stress like they, they tend to be rotated less frequently you know like old goalkeepers are you know like that's a no-brainer for me particularly when they've got such high clean sheet potential so i just i just find it fascinating and i i, I do feel like people are oh like if you think about waiting of like you know things or metrics that matter when it comes to making a decision on purchasing a player and their value, I feel like the market overvalues resale value. Yeah, like, and they're agree. almost like completely and utterly neglecting the what can I win with this card mm. and thinking about resale value. Potentially, length of utility plays into that. You know, someone might say, "Oh, you know, I want to buy a card that I can use for three years, four years." But sure, is that realistic? Like it, it, with all due respect, unless you're buying somebody like a Kimmich, who is at the top of their game in a top club in a top division with a very, very low chance of transferring, can you really guarantee that you're going to get four years of consistent output from many cards on the game? Yeah, um, and I don't know whether it's because I play under twenty three actively that I sort of have a different look at this because. There's such a high turnover in a 23. Like you need to literally like forget about <laughs> forget about who was good last year, who's going to be good this year, get on them and then you know sort of move them on when when they um inevitably transfer to a mid-table champion side. <laughs> um but yeah, I think as well, like some of the older players, like it can be a little bit more predictable. Like you know that like if you know their situation. Four, and they, yeah. yeah, exactly. You know their situation and you know that they're less likely to have a move. Um but yeah, I think like for me, like I've picked up a handful of them. Like I got Armani, I got Nacho Fernandez from River, who's like 34, 33, 34. I got Maxi Morales, I got Brahim Alaman. You know, I was considering uh, Sin Jin Ho, like the Korean um, midfielder who was very, very good last year. He's like 34. He's just got a move to Incheon, who are, um, you know, arguably a more offensive side than um, Pohang. So although he might not be, as dominant in terms of the amount of possession within the team that he has, 
the decisive potential is is I think much higher at a stronger side. Um, but again, you know, you can get all these players for like less than not before ETH for a rare. Um, I think Chin Jin Ho is one of the more expensive ones just because he was hyped up a lot last season. But you know, when you look at the comparative, like for me, the comparison for players like Maxi Morales and Nacho Fernandez, we're talking Mukhtar, we're talking Gil, we're talking yep. Zellerayan in America. Yeah. I think the cheapest one of those is Zellerayan, and he's like 0.8, 0.7, 0.8 at the moment. Like, give or take, I might have checked my numbers. I've not been, I've not looked at his price this week, but you know, it's six times at least more expensive. I, 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 I don't know. I just find it wild. I find it wild. Um, but yeah, I, I, who's who's your favourites? Like, do you have some other than Naboa? Like, you know, who are who are the ones that you sort of have done well for you over the years, and so or, or what? Maybe ones that you're you're looking at, at the moment. Yeah, so what I'm looking at at the moment, just because I think his price is bonkers, um, it's staying in Russia, actually. So, again, this maybe plays into it. You know, they're obviously not back until the 5th of March. So we've got, like, what, five weeks to wait for some utility. Um, and then that'll run. He'll run until the start of May in the league and then have a break until the second week in July. So we'll have uh, basically a five, another five-week break um, from May until july but um just to reiterate your point on our goalkeepers it's it's igor akinfiev um so akinfiev has a contract extension until 2024 um club legend will never be replaced as number one goalkeeper he is probably the surest goalkeeper on the game to keep their spot like when he's in contract with csk um you know he will play so uh there's absolutely no question about that and the last rare akinfiev sold for 0.24 um which Kidding. is that's ridiculous. ludicrous. <laughs> like, and if people are like, "Oh, I need an America goalkeeper to play in the summer," like, you know, you can spend whatever it is one ETH on Andre Blake, and obviously, you know, you can play all the way through, or you can spend 0.24 on Igor Akinfiev, and you know, you have a five week break where maybe you have to, you know, you have to do something else. Um, but you know, it. I just think it seems mad, and. I think the reason this seems mad is he's like he's a good goalie. He's not. I mean, the, the um, Siska haven't had a, a great time defensively, sort of the first half of the season. But he's made you know a pen save and got a couple of clean sheets um, to, to sort of boost some scores. But if they manage to turn things around the second half of the season, you know they've got some nice fixtures: uh, Krilia, Fakel, Himki, all in the first five. So you know you could potentially have three clean sheets there. Um, and yeah, I just think his price per per potential point is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, so, so what yeah, you're I've, saying is, I need to get a super rare I can fear for capped. Well, they're only point seven on. I mean, and again, you probably get that down because two times last, you're probably looking sort of two two and a half times last rare, aren't you? So yeah. you can get that for point five. That's point five. Yeah. So, that. so yeah, yeah, I mean, let, like there's four up, all between point seven and point eight. So. You know, if they want to sell them, they're going to have to shift down a little bit. But yeah, it just seems absolutely wild to me. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, the last to... sale for him, the last sale was not point, not point five nine nine, not point six dead on. Really? Yeah, for the super. Yeah, yeah, I can believe that. So, and again, like you're getting a a quality goalkeeper at least for the to the end of next year. And you know, who knows if he renews again? Um, you know, there was obviously some talk he would retire, but that's obviously been put to bed for now. Um, one card. It's one of those good. players as well that like you could easily see them going on to like forty, right? Oh yeah, if like he wants club to. legend, yeah, just, yeah. if he wants to, just keep playing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing just to reiterate, sort of your earlier point. Actually, if anyone has access to premium Surrey tools, I'm not sure if you if you do text. Um, obviously, a lot of the stuff you can do on Surrey Dates now. But um, one thing that is absolutely amazing on Surrey tools is the reward analyzer because it looks at the player contribution to. Um, lineups where you've won rewards and then generates a ETH amount based per player based on the amount they scored that game week as your yield for that card. Does that make sense? So, you know, um, the one, the card I'm looking at on my Sura Tools is Mickey Lindel, <laughs> um, who I purchased uh, last year towards the start of the Austrian Bundesliga season for 06 I think acquisition 0.629. So for a, and this is a super air. So for a 35 year old super air, it was a lot. Uh, that was when ETH September 21. So ETH was probably a good two and a half, three k there, something like that in in pounds. Um, he was a 
beast for the start of that season, wasn't he? Like he was just exactly. like absolutely munching AA. Yeah. So during M- Mickey Lindell's time that I had him, which is there a date on here? Oh yeah. So the fourth of September twenty one until the end of last season, obviously because he then transferred to the second division in Austria um, and is no longer playable. Um, he won me two podiums, point nine in ETH value, uh, like cash value. Um, Alexander Kolovin Super Rare and Simon Mignolet Rare were the two sort of the two big prizes he wrote, he won me, and his personal contribution to that was 0. 0.744 um, in uh, cards and cash. When you divide that by his contribution to the team in terms of how many points he scored per per lineup, so his he's probably a completely dead card. I don't know if he's going to renew next year if they get promoted, um, but you know he probably just retires. But it you know it. It doesn't matter. I, you know, I won a, a goal of in Super using him, um, which I then traded or sold for a decent chunk. And, and you know, Stamignole I won, which I can now use in, in other lineups. So, you know, he was a real favourite of mine last year. Um, and another thing I just wanted to add, oh, also my other favourites, actually. One of them actually was Leo Rafailov, who you spoke about, though he is coming to the end of his contract this year, is injured, seems to have been fallen out of faith a little bit with a new manager. But, his super I got for like point one or something. Um, and you know, he's again won me lots of cards over the I actually the f- I actually had two of him. So the first one I picked up for point two and then sold for like point seven two or something at the start of, of this year. And then when he obviously wasn't playing it it dipped back down again. So I grabbed another one. But um yeah, he's been really good. He really went I remember I, I had two of his rares and I think at one point I sold one of the rares for something crazy maybe around 0.3 but he went on like yeah. just an absolute ripping run of form where he smacked a bunch of hundreds and i remember like his price started spiraling and i was like okay this is exit time yeah. um I've, I've made my money you know i've got my returns for if i love he's won me a few cards but you know this was this, that was sort of like the time where it got um you know it was good to get out um Another one, though, as well, like, it, I suppose the things do change so quickly, right? You know, like, Rud Vorma would be one yeah. I put in this old but gold category. Yeah. He went from being an absolute smasher. Almost unless Rouge, like, must so, have. He yeah, was absolutely. Double. Like, yeah, uh, to completely out of the team. Yeah, I think at the time I sold my Rafailov and bought Vorma, um, but then Vorma very, very quickly disappeared from the Bruges squad. I think it was... It might have been when Alfred Schroeder took the job because I think under Clement, Vorma was was really, really key. But then I think what happened is Clement went to Monaco. I think this, thing, this seems to make sense from a timing perspective. Clement, Clement went to Monaco, in came Schroeder, and he just decided to kill an old SO5 god, much like he did when he went to Ajax, uh, <laughs> Daily Blind. Um, so, you know, I'd probably put Schroeder up there as, as one of the least least liked managers ever by so rare managers maybe we need an award maybe we need to do a twitter poll which manager you know drop 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 us in the comments below which manager do you despise the most <laughs> as a, as a solo manager yeah i think um i had a vorma and traded him for like really really low value um which you know, there was a time when you were you were laying up a trade and you were talking to me about whether to include Vorma or Michele, wasn't there? Yeah, I seem to remember that. <laughs> yes. and I think I think we ended up like it, deciding we ended up on Michele. I think Michele yeah. was was more replaceable. And Damn. yeah, that didn't go well. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just looking at my Remco Pasvir Super because this card is like the absolute definition of just like buying an old goalie. I picked him up for 0.18. When he just transferred to Ajax, and people were like, "Will he or won't he start?" And again, sometimes you just got to take these chances. Um, and yeah, like his total rewards amount just for him is is an ETH for me. So he's been involved in podiums, tier ones, star rares, a lot. So yeah, you, you see know, the downside risk as well. Crazy. Right? Like if you're paying less than 0.2 on a card, they don't actually have to win you a lot to pay back that investment. Yeah. Right, and if and if they don't, you know, they don't end up delivering as you maybe hope they would. Then actually, it's not a significant. It's not a huge amount that's stuck into it, right? Absolutely, better than my one point nine purchase of Stephen Bergwijn. That's for sure. <laughs> um, 
We just have that. to create a prayer circle and hope that Schroeder <laughs> disappears and Ajax become well, SO5 gods again. Well, I actually moved out of him. I uh, did a direct swap uh, for Marco Levaya. And it was actually quite funny watching the floors because um, when I did the swap, like Bergwijn's floor was like 0.2 higher than Levaya's, which is probably why the chap took the trade. And then after the weekend, when Bergwijn was again on the bench and Levaya scored, the floor on Levaya went up to like 1.3 and the floor on Bergwijn went down to 0.7. <laughs> So, uh, so I was like, "Wow, okay, this is a uh, this has worked out." Um, but I think, well. yeah, but I think the, the Bergwijn's has rebounded a bit after he came he came onto the pitch. Um, but yeah, the last auction went for point seven two of Stephen Bergwijn. So, um, mm-hmm. anyway, he's far too young for us to be talking about today, isn't he? Absolutely, um, no <laughs> under under thirties chat today, which One actually thing- brings it on. Oh, sorry, go ahead. But just one thing I was going to say is I also find buying old players really nice for the short game weeks. Um, this mm-hmm. midweek, uh, Luke de Jong got injured last weekend and uh, it was just, you know, RVN said that he wasn't going to play the midweek and would probably play the weekend. So um, I needed a forward because he was my only forward option for this midweek. It's really short. There's only like Netherlands playing and a couple of other teams. Um, and I was looking at the forwards and I was like, Do you know what? I'm just going to buy Barak Yilmaz because... He's basically a 60 or 30, but, um, you know, out of the options that I had, he was like 0.05. Where is and he on that these days? Fortuna Sittard. Oh, wow. He's the, yeah. he's the Zion Fleming replacement. Exactly, right? So um, he's on all penalties and stuff for Fortuna, and they had a nice matchup this weekend uh, against Here and Veen at home. Um, and, yeah, like, you know, it is a bit of a throwaway, but... You know, if he scores, then that's fantastic. And like you say, well, if, he, if he starts, if he scores, it's 35 more points than you would well, have got without Exactly, him, right? right? And if he scores and, you know, I net a tier one or above, like I can just discard him. There's no, it doesn't matter what, you know, what else happens. Um, so those, you know, those weeks where you need a, we need a card and you think, oh, I just need this to go and play this division because everyone does it. Um, then, yeah, you know, have a look at some older players because they're going to be significantly cheaper. And, you know, if you just want him for one week, I did think, you know, once the game week locks, just trade them to Powell for similar value and, you know, you, nothing lost. Yeah. But I didn't. I've kept hold of him. <laughs> Camber away at the weekend. So, you know, oh, it's a guaranteed useful. goal, you know. So. Useful, absolutely. <laughs> Camber have been absolutely oh, trash this season, so haven't they? bad, yeah. yeah. Just can't score. They've scored nine goals all season. It's scored like two, two open play goals or something ridiculous. Mm. So what you need, what you're saying is that this weekend, all in on the uh, the Fortuna defensive stack. Well, could well be, couldn't it? That's. <laughs> Are there any old beasts in the Fortuna defence? That's the question. I don't know. I haven't no, it doesn't look like there is. Even their goalkeepers, U23. Oof, no, get that chat out of here. <laughs> no, no, U23 <laughs> chat today. We went, we went over 32. Talking Ivo, about that, Ivo can Pinto. We, can we, 33-year-old right-back for Fortuna Sittard. There nice. you go. Get him in. Get him in. Um, <laughs> go on. We did have that one week yes, where we had... Over's over tournament. Tournament. Yeah, never to be seen again. That was um, superb. Yeah. yeah, that was great. If we're listening so rare, bring it back, please. Yeah, yeah. I could field like seven teams in that division, so please, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll have yeah. more of that. I do wonder if we will see more because now we've got the capped modes and sort of that sort of defined structure. I do wonder if we'll have more topical special weeklies. Like I remember when I first joined the platform, there was like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, MLS special challenge where you could only use like players from the Los Angeles Derby. You know, we had one this week where you could only use players from AC Milan and Lazio, I think. Like yeah. I do wonder if if there will be more of these like creative challenges that sort of come back into the mix and like you know we see them one week we you know we don't see them again for a while um but saying that it does seem that we're going to have and we'll talk about it more next week but it does seem like we're we're now going to be overflowing with capped modes and league challenges and and all sorts going on so i don't know whether expecting a another another tournament is a little bit too much to ask at this stage but um yeah i think i did enjoy that um the over, under under twenty threes and over thirty twos one that they did that time. Um, maybe that's what we need to to you know stimulate the value for these these old boy cards, Josh. 
Yeah, I'd be very keen on the Croatian Eternal Derby uh, for there just to be a competition with those because I'd clean up there. That's, that's Dynamo Zagreb versus Hadrick Split. Zagreb um, stacking coming. Yeah. yeah, and I've got, you know, I've just got all their cards, basically. Um, so yeah, that'd be good. And, you know, tickets to a tickets to a Zagreb game, yeah, that'd be sweet. Give me the... Um, now you just got to hope that Luka Modric's, you know, go, well, goes to Croatia in the summer. You know, Modric to Zagreb, you know, just this another is why season. I'm holding on. I mean, uh, how much money is he going to be on at Real Madrid? Like a hundred grand a week or something? I, I can't see it personally. He's not going to go down to like. I wonder what the max wage Dynamo Zagreb offers. Probably like I don't know, twenty k or something. So yeah, I doubt it, but you never know. Could happen. I think. Um, oh, a good, a good topic actually would be champion old players moving to challenger um for like a swan song you know um i did read that uh ivan perisic um i don't know how long he's in contract at tottenham he's spoken that he wants to return to hadrick split um when his tottenham contract is up which is at the end of next season so yeah that would make a lot of sense and i feel like those moves are just like they're just they're a bit gold mining, aren't they? I'm trying to think of yeah. some. I guess Luke De Jong to PSV is is one from Barca to PSV, but he hasn't exactly been good. Um, mm. But there must be there must be some. I'm trying to think yeah. of some. I'm trying to think. Well, maybe Yilmaz. Yilmaz is one. He right. was at Yilmaz, Lille last year. Lille, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. That's a good shout. But yeah, those that type of player. That you know, it must be good for SO5 or must increase their yeah their SO5 value. I'm trying to think of of others. It's it's tough actually. I, I'm struggling. Yeah, but you the do... only thing I can think of right now is a move from champion to Asia, and that's Ronaldo. So oh, well, there you go. But you do get you do sometimes <laughs> get those career moves, don't you? Where you know, um, and it, again, it hasn't sort of it's not quite the same, but like your David Silva from Man City to wherever he went to. I can't remember. Um, Sociedad, I think. Sociedad, yeah. You know, yeah. those kind of moves, like... We had um, a couple of seasons kind of ago, move. we had Tevez like, going back to, to Boca. Exactly. Like, going back to clubs, I think, is really What I really mentioned earlier, Mauro Acardi from, uh, from Inter to... Uh, what was he at yeah. PSG? PSG? He was at PSG, yeah, yeah. He went into PSG, Galatasaray. Yeah. The, so one, the one that I'm really hoping for at the moment, and I read a, a news story the other day that suggested that this was the, the, the transfer he would be open to, is Mariota Morioka, who uh, yeah. was a crusher last season, this season has been benched. He said if he was to return to the J-League, he only wanted to play for Vissel Kobe because um, there was a newly promoted side that had approached him in January because he's not playing at Charleroi anymore. Um, and I was just thinking, like, if Morioka... Like, that's one of those, like, nostalgia signings, right? Like, going back to the club that you started your career at. If Morioka goes back to the J-League, then watch this space because he is going to be absolute crusher um but i feel like the, there is a few like that i think like you know uh, i was reading angel di maria the other day like he's open to a return to um i think he started his career at rosario in argentina right um you know he was open to a move back to end his career there um you know so that's yeah i think a really interesting one to watch particularly when they go to you know one of the leagues where they where they could still be dominant um, particularly if they're on set pieces, you know, they don't need Absolutely. to run if they're on set pieces when it comes yeah. to so rare, you know, <laughs> none of this pressing lark. Who needs tackles? Who needs defensive actions? Just, you know, ideally what you want is a, is an old boy set piece taker and a, a, a number nine target man. So you can just yeah. churn out uh, key passes from headers that sort of loosely, go near the goal from inside the box. <laughs> like when Carlos Gill was playing with Adam Buxer at Revolution, like any time he planted a ball on Buxer's head, it was like, oh, there's a couple of points. And uh, do you want a couple more? Uh, yeah, cool. Have a few more. Um, it's quite funny you mentioned that. not Belgium because, uh, because Opta just, you know, Opta in Belgium. Oh, right. just... <laughs> the reviewer doesn't like you. 
Yeah. It's quite funny you mentioned that. You're literally just describing mm-hmm. Christian De Boer's game. When you watch him, like he doesn't run. He just like trots around in the middle of the pitch. And then the young, energetic Sochi players like win the ball back and just pass in the ball. And he like sprays mm-hmm. 40 yards diagonals and yeah. and all that jazz and takes all the set pieces. And you're like, you're absolutely right. It is very effective SO5. What do we want? We want lethargic throwback <laughs> tens, you know, like the tens yeah. of the nineties, you know, we want like Raquel May. Yeah. We want those throwback tens, you know, they're sort of like football we'd see in the nineties where you'd have a guy that just really physically wasn't at it regardless of the age, but you know, just on the ball was incredible and set piece delivery. And like you said, just sort of, waltzing around the pitch and, and spraying passes about in the final third is, is what we want. Absolutely. Um, mm. I think another thing which could be more considered is, uh, is for say, cat mode with older players because their game time is normally much more managed, especially if you're buying a, a champion player. Um, but when they do start, like if they're you know a decent player, they likely do well. I guess I'll use Mod- Modric as the example here. Um, you know, when he when he starts, he has a L40 of 62. And then when, obviously, like, this is pretty basic stuff because, um, actually, let's do it on L15 because that is what we're actually basing the cat mode off. So in starts, he has a L15 of 57.7. When you add in the bench entries as well he has an l15 of 53.2 so if you can predict that he starts then obviously you're getting like a four point edge there and i imagine there's probably some which are similar if not bigger um mm. you know and it, i think that's good as well easy because predict, I guess. clubs like real madrid you tend to get lineup exactly. line up uh day before right yeah absolutely and mm. i don't obviously like you know an l and an l15 of 53 you know, isn't breaking the bank in the cat mode? That's not that's not terrible. Um, I'd no. be interested in what's happened to Thomas Muller. Why is his score so bad? He's just not been playing so much, has he? Yeah, he's had loads of DMPs. Was he injured? Mm, possibly. I don't oh, really he's... follow by him that much. Yeah, it looks like he was injured before the World Cup and then just come off the bench twice. But I thought he might be a good one. You know, again, if you can predict when he starts, he's obviously, mm. you know, that's yeah. obviously going to be a favourable. A favorable um sort of matchup. Yeah. Well, this this is what I liked about um about Morales is normally getting team news for MLS sites is like getting blood out of a stone. It's yeah. just ridiculous yeah. how little information comes out. But you know, there's so many journalists covering the teams in Argentina that if you follow the right journalists, like they're telling you like the formations in training throughout the week, and they're like, okay, no, this is the the last team that was put out, and it tends to be like the last team that they sort of run as an 11 in training tends to be the starting 11 in Argentina more times than not. So, and there's just so many journalists covering it. You tend to get like a daily update on like what's going on, who was in training, who wasn't. So even if Morales has his minutes managed, there's still a good chance that you will know when he's going to play, when he's not going to play, which yeah. I think it's great, right? Cause you don't need a player to play every game. You just need to know when they're playing like and, uh, mm. and be able to sort of have some confidence that you're, you're putting a lineup before five starters in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, and I think that tends to happen more to older players, doesn't it? Than than yeah. young ones. So again, with yeah. the cap mode in mind, I think that is a a genuine strategy, at least. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it could be a very, very useful one. Um making me think now I need to go and get some uh, get a few more players. Uh, you know, who's gonna be my uh you know, old boys, you know, the uh the Masters. Let's play capped with cap mode with Masters <laughs> players. Yeah, that'd be good fun. Amazing. I'm trying to think who else. The one that I know uh, uh, Andy Laird and PSU were talking about the other day, but uh, oh, oh boy, Bradley Guzan is another one that comes to mind. When you think about managed minutes, you know, is he still playing? To... Well, he did his, he, I think he did his ACL or he did a serious injury last season. Uh, he oh. hasn't been playing, but I think he's been, he's been working his way, his way back. Um, and I was thinking the other day and I was like, I think he's like 38 now. Yeah. And I was like, to want to come back from an ACL at that age suggests that there's something driving him. Like he, he's motivated to do something more than, I, I want to you know play another season. And I had a look the other day and, and Casey Keller 
played until he was 40 in the MLS. Right. So I've got I've got a feeling that 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 old boy Brady Guzan is is basically gunning for the MLS age appearance record because he's gone through so much to to get back at this stage of his career. Like I just don't think you're going to go through, you know, almost like a whole year of recuperation to to just play one more season, right? <laughs> Maybe yeah, I'm wrong, think- but I feel like there's something there's something driving him. And when I looked at that the other day, I was like, that would make sense. Like if he wants to be like, you know, the oldest goalkeeper to ever, ever play in the MLS. And I feel like, you know, before he got injured, he was in, you know, he seemed to be in pretty good condition. So if like he can stay physically healthy, I see no reason why a goalkeeper couldn't play until 40 in the MLS. Yeah. Did you see um the Craig Gordon stuff? which is just absolutely mental. He had a double leg fracture a month ago yesterday. Oh, and then wow. yes, yesterday, and he's 40 years old. And then yeah. yesterday he posts uh, a thing on Twitter of him working in the gym, like with his broken leg, like out really? of cast and like, you know, like working with it to like, yeah. to like rehab it. So I think a lot wow. of people thought that he would just, you Be know, he, yeah. he would just retire, but it seems like he wants to come back and um be right back. Just going to yeah. check the price of Craig Gordon. Yeah. <laughs> well, someone swept up the Super Airs yesterday. There were two on the market for like 0.09 each or something. Really? So, uh, yeah, they saw the photos and, and bought them both, which... Oh, yeah, wow, yeah. There's play. been a little... little uh, Bit of a run on him, little... hasn't there? I think. Yeah. I think yeah, McBride yeah. swept up like all the limited floor as well, actually. Um, oh, yeah, McBride. Yeah, he grabbed one of the Super Airs as well, look. Oh really? They're all oh. from yeah, less than 0.1 ETH for a super rare goalkeeper. Look at that. Um, yeah, I mean, but the thing, this is it, right? Is that you can sort of tell a little bit from the player's behaviour how motivated they are to come back from injury, or whether they are likely to just call it a day. Yeah, um, and I think that that's a really sort of valuable, um, you know, thing to consider when you're looking at this. Crikey, the first the first limited ball on that run was 0.0023. What is that? Two is that two pounds or twenty p? Hang on, let me have a look. Twenty pence, I think, isn't it? No, it is two pounds. Oh, two, it pounds is two pounds. Two pounds seventy six. Oh, wow. And oh, then it's dear. jumped up. Someone paid 0.083. So yeah, eighty quid. Is that uh, no eight eight quid. No eight ten. Quid. Eleven 10 pounds. pounds. So yeah, it, it went from. Two pounds seventy six to ten pounds eighty eight in what period time period is that? In less than an hour. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There we go. Just because he go. posted some photos. But you know, obviously it does look like he wants to return. So that is that is good news. I think yeah. um I think he wanted to play because he's still the national team goalkeeper, I think. I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying. So I think he wants to play the Euros and then retire. Am I, yeah, I am right. I am right. So yeah, yeah so uh, so we'll see if that happens. But um, I just thought that was wild. Like it, I've done a double leg fracture, and you know, I was, uh, I've done that's such, such terrible English. I suffered a double leg fracture, and um, I was twenty one at the time, I think. Um, mm. and yeah, you know, I had quite a quick recovery. I was back playing football again after I think it was ten or eleven weeks, but um. I, you know, I was 21. This guy is literally double mm-hmm. my age, and you know, this just seems crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, there we go. Uh, research for this week or homework for this week is to go away and look at old players that people thought of retired because <laughs> they're injured, but they're actually not. Um, that's the tr- new trading meta. Actually, I was, I was going to call this podcast uh, "Age is Age is Just a Number," but I'm going to I'm going to go all clickbait and go new so rare trading meta 2023. Exclamation mark! Uh, yeah, with Josh Forth. Yeah. Um, good. Well, I mean, what incredible piece of info to end this podcast on, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> drop yeah. in, drop in some some trading insight. You could have literally five x your money if you were the first person to. If you if you had tweet notifications or Instagram notifications on for Craig Gordon, you could have could have absolutely cleaned up. Um, clearly McBride did so you know here yes. we go um, I'm now going to go and add add more players to follow I'm all about journalists on Twitter but you know I think I need to follow some players as well now, so um, well it's been it's been a pleasure um, we'll be back next week to talk about the imminent arrival of capped modes 
trapped modes everywhere. Um, yep. Yeah. Thank you for your time, Josh. And I will speak to you next week. Thanks, mate.